thank you for having me here. I'm very happy to introduce some of our work. The title of my presentation is Current Developments in Experimental and Regulatory Toxicology. So it is a fairly general title and I also will give some general introduction to toxicology and to food safety. But of course, uh, I will also uh, take the opportunity and present some examples of um, our work. I would like to start by introducing some general principles of food safety. Um, as you've heard already, um, uh, I'm professor for food safety now, um, starting last winter semester. So I'm with the faculty now for about one year. Um, and uh, since we're working at the food safety department, you see here, I hope you can see my mouse if I show something. Is that, can you see that? Yes, we can see. Good, it. Great. So um, I don't want to go into detail here. Food safety is a, a fairly broad topic. We do not cover all of that with our research, um, but I just would quickly like to mention the, these seven principles. Um, so there's corporate responsibility. So food safety is the issue of those people bringing food on the market. Usually it's the companies, so it's not responsibility of the government or regulatory authorities. It's not the responsibility of the consumer. Another principle is traceability. That's something very important in food safety. So the different batches of, of food items can be followed backwards whenever there's any issue in, uh, in terms of safety. Um, we do have official food and feed control, even though I said in the first point, uh, it's the companies that are responsible, but of course, regulatory authorities need to control that. Uh, so we have food and feed controls. We have the precautionary principle, especially in the European Union. That's that's a very important principle, meaning that um, risk management decisions can also be taken if there is uncertainty or uh, about a food safety issue. No, so not only if something is really very well established with hard evidence, uh, the authorities can step in, but also if there is uncertainty. And then we have the three steps, uh, scientific risk assessment, scientific risk management or risk management and risk communication. I will um, come back to that later on in the second part when I talk a little bit about uh, regulatory toxicology. But just to let you know that we are more or less uh, associated mainly with this point number five. So we do experimental toxicology work and maybe later on also some regulatory toxicology uh, to establish new evidence about toxicological information that would feed into risk assessment. Because of course, toxicology risks can only be assessed properly if we have data and information um, underpinning it. Um, what hazards do we look at in food um, in general that can be distinguished into three different categories, biological hazards, chemical hazards and physical hazards. Um, biological hazards uh, are mainly micro microbial um, hazards, so different bacteria, but also other microorganisms. Um, we're not so much into that topic. Physical hazards um, are particularly of concern for acute toxicity that might be insects, as you can see here in this picture, but the, the more common physical hazards are um, uh, broken glass, for example, or some other broken parts of machines where, where, where physical agents come into a food agent and that, of course, can give rise to, to acute injuries. And then there's the third part, chemical hazards. This is what we're dealing with. So chemical substances that can be found in food, uh, of course, can give rise to a variety of toxicity endpoints, uh, not only acute, as in the case of physical hazards, but also chronic. And actually, these are more prominent, more important, because they're more difficult to, to assess. Chemical hazards in food are usually grouped in three or four different categories. One is residues. Uh, residues are like, for example, pesticide substances that are brought into the food chain consciously, um, but are not wanted in the final food uh, item, in the final end product, but cannot be uh, um, avoided all the time. We heard already in the early introduction that um, the, um, reducing the amount of pesticides is one of the, the goals of phenorop also. And of course, this implies toxicological evaluation of the substances. Not all all of them are bad, some are more, some are worse, some are better. Um, and so these residues are one part of chemical hazards. Uh, there's other groups here in this category also, like for example, animal drugs, pharmaceutical drugs used for animals 
that are also consciously brought into the food chain, but are not wanted in the final end product. Then there is another category of ingredients. Uh, I took this exemplary picture here, uh, which is supposed to show it. That's not only single substances that can be unhealthy, but it can also be a diet in general that might be unhealthy. Um, but it might also be a specific single substance ingredients that might be of toxicology concern. Um, and in this category of ingredients, we also have additives. Additives are substances that are consciously brought into the food chain and that are also wanted in the final product. And then we have, on the other hand, this is shown here on the right hand side, um, substances that are called contaminants. These are substances that are not consciously brought into the food chain, but by, by accident, not voluntarily. Um, usually, oh, sorry, um, usually they are distributed uh, or separated into two classes. There is um, um, environmental contaminants that are ubiquitous, um, for example, coming from um, from industrial pollution coming here to the fields or also to the farms and then we have a ubiquitous distribution of these substances or process contaminants these are uh, substances brought into the food chain on specific uh, process steps um, be it for example what is shown here during growth or harvesting and i think these are also pictures that that many of you in Finerop are, are familiar with um, what you see here is a chamomile uh, field that has some weeds in there, uh, Huflattich and Jakobskreuzkraut. I had to look that up in English. It's Colts, Food and Ragwort. And uh, these substances, uh, these, sorry, these weeds, uh, especially Ragwort, can produce hepatotoxic compounds that can lead to liver cancer. And this is a serious problem for, for many um, for many teas, um, herbal teas, black teas, Räubusch tea particular, in particular because uh, especially in the past it was difficult or, or impossible to, to exclude these weeds um, from the harvest, particularly for Räubusch tea, not only chamomile as is shown here. So this is certainly a topic highly relevant for Finerop as well. Um, the toxicity or toxicology assessment includes various endpoints. I'm not going to go into detail about that. Um, just to name a few, toxicokinetics is the, is the part of toxicology that deals about what happens to the substance in the body. So it's the distribution within the body, the metabolism, and so on. So many other endpoints. Uh, we have local toxicity that is shown here. The second part, irritation, corrosivity, sensitization, especially skin sensitization. And then we have uh, the major distinguishing between acute toxicity and chronic or repeated dose toxicity. Repeated dose toxicity, so this is, this is when you apply a substance for a single time once or during one day and repeated dose toxicity if you have a longer exposure time that may, might be weeks, months, but it might also be years or decades. Um, and that um, toxicity assessment for these different endpoints then leads to certain labeling or hazard identification. Uh, repeated dose toxicity, chronic toxicity, then can be subclassified into various different categories. And I just named uh, or put here on the slides a few of them. And we are specifically in our group interested in mutagenicity, genotoxicity, and carcinogenicity. We do not assess carcinogenicity ourselves. That involves usually long-term uh, epidemiological studies or long-term bioassays, so animal experiments. Um, and one of the major current developments in toxicology, and actually it's not so new, it's, it's years or maybe decades old, is the question whether, um, whether long-term bioassays and animal studies can be replaced by in vitro studies by finding suitable alternatives and um, for carcinogenicity, as a, as, a, as a special endpoint for chronic toxicity, um, this development is quite highly preceded already because mutagenicity and genotoxicity, which are the study of DNA damage, um, is a strong surrogate endpoint for carcinogenicity. I'll come back to that um, later on. Um, cancer, maybe just to name that, has several hallmarks. There was a seminal paper in 2011 establishing uh, for basic hallmarks and then also emerging and enabling hallmarks and characteristics. Um, again, I'm not going to go into detail 
just naming that uh, uh, cell metabolism, immune function, inflammation are very important hallmarks and characteristic, but particularly genome instability and mutations are considered a, a hallmark characteristic of, of, um, of cancer or cancer forming substances. And one of the latest developments here is uh, just earlier this week, I attended the International Congress of Toxicology where a lot was uh, talked about key characteristics of cancer. So this, this concept of hallmarks of cancer is further developed on, and it was proposed a couple of years ago, And but this is really getting into motion now only that, that there is many more key characteristics of cancer. And I would like to draw your attention to this right part here. So there is many key characteristics of um, of carcinogens, so cancer-forming chemicals that involve DNA, as you can see here in this picture, and the genotoxicity, so the study of DNA damage, uh, is is one central aspect of that. So, so this is one of the motivations, one of the backgrounds why uh, we are interested in. Of course, there is also a high biological relevance for cancer formation. Um, you see here are statistics um, in the European Union by uh, showing the causes of death. Uh, you see that number one cause of death is disease of the circulatory system, cardiovascular diseases. Um, but the second uh, most important cause of death is cancer already. And when you look at the temporal uh, development, which I do not show here, you will see that um, uh, death by cardiovascular diseases is declining while there's um, by cancer is increasing and it's expecting that within a couple of, of decades, two to three decades, probably cancer will be the leading cause of death. Again, showing that this is highly important. Um, now, as I said, we do not assess carcinogenicity ourselves, but we look at DNA damage effects. Uh, we use various genotoxicity testing methods. Um, uh, again, I will not go into detail here, but just to mention a few assays. So for example, chromosome aberration assay and the micronucleus assay that we use a lot in our lab assesses chromosomal damage. So on the uh, so this is not on the level of the DNA strand, but on the level of the chromosomes where various structural uh, malformations can occur. Or also, if you have a whole chromosome here, I'll later say something about that uh, leading to an oplody. We also assess, um, uh, for example, in the Comet assay DNA damage on the DNA strand uh, level. So that's usually single strand breaks or also double strand breaks. Um, and there's a number of other, other tests, um, for example, gamma H2AX as a, as a response to DNA damage, but also the AIMS test, for example, many of you might heard of that, looking at uh, base mutations. I briefly would like to uh, uh, show you the formation of micronuclei because that's something that we deal with a lot. So micronuclei occur when the cell is dividing. Normally we have during cell division, Oops, sorry. Um, we have the chromosomes being separated. They have been duplicated before, and normally we do not see this here, uh, but only the, um, the, the the chromosomes segregated to the two daughter poles. And micronuclei occur when there is damage in terms of either chromosomal damage that leads to a chromosomal fragment here lying apart because that cannot be detached to the spindle apparatus. Um, or it can also be a whole chromosome that is not uh, being distributed evenly. And after um, karyokinesis, we do have these so-called micronuclei. The, the, the main nuclei form their own nuclear membrane as well as the, the chromosome or chromosomal fragment. And these are then called micronuclei. And after cytokinesis, we do have a cell without a micronucleus, seemingly normal, but it might not be normal because the, the chromosome might uh, be left here. And then we have the micronucleated cell. This can be assessed fairly easily microscopically. You see that here. Um, so what you see here is skin cells, human Hakat cells, um, where you see the cell nucleus here in yellowish, greenish, and then you see the, the, the cell plasma, the cell body in uh, reddish, brownish, and you can nicely, I'm sorry, nicely see here these small structures here. These are the micronuclei, either containing a whole chromosome or here, just probably uh, a smaller in size, a chromosomal fragment. 
This is two-dimensional uh, micronucleus analysis. We have also, and this is something that this, this is classically done, and we do that regularly in the lab. We've also tried to analyze um, micronuclei in three dimensions. This is shown here. Um, where we uh, answered or tried to answer the question whether micronuclei, if they lie on top here, can also be distinguished. Because if I go back once, of course, you can easily see that these micronuclei, if they're lying here, it's very easy to, to analyze them, to quantify them, but they might also be on top or below the main nucleus. Um, and this is what we looked at here. And then we, we had in cooperation with, with collaboration partners. We didn't do that ourselves, played around a little bit with three-dimensional analysis and uh, we, we, we achieved quantification, but I think certainly this is not something that will be used or can be used at the moment in, in regular screening or regular testing. Um, I would also like to mention that there is a strong uh, correlation between micronucleus frequency and cancer incidence and cancer mortality also, because as I mentioned, genotoxicity endpoints are used as a surrogate, as an indicator test method for carcinogenicity. And this has long been only theoretically established, but we now know that there is a clear correlation because we see that in, um, in volunteers and in people, or not in volunteers and patients where we, um, analyze um, micronucleus frequency in lymphocytes, and then we stratify them in low micronucleus frequency and high micronucleus frequency. So the low one is here in blue, the high one is in red. And we see that those with a high frequency later on, so years and maybe a decade later on, have um, much higher cancer mortality. Uh, this, this is shown here. So survival probability course of, of cancer is much lower here than in those people with a low micronucleus frequency. Um, this, of course, only establishes correlation. It doesn't say anything about a causal relationship. And this is something that we also like to address in our research. I would like to give a few examples, two or three examples about what we look at. What we see here is resveratrol, uh, main ingredient of red wine. And uh, this is a substance that was strongly discussed about uh, DNA, DNA damage uh, forming properties, but also protective properties. I didn't mention that earlier on, but we don't only look at DNA damage, but also at protective effects and uh, DNA repair, for example. And what we see in uh, when we look at uh, respiratrol, both in vitro and in vivo, we see that when we treat um, cells with a known DNA damaging agent, if you focus on this here, this is not, these are cells not treated with resveratrol. The zero indicates the concentration of resveratrol here in this in vitro system. All of these batches are treated with MMC. It's a known genotoxic substance, and we have a clear DNA damage increased here. So this is a fairly high frequency of micronuclei. And then when we co-treat these samples with resveratrol, this is shown here, we see a clear decrease. So we do not only look, as I just said, do not only look at genotoxic properties, but also at anti-genotoxic properties, protecting cells um, against DNA damage. What is very interesting about this one is here, why I also chose this example, is that the, the protective effect of resveratrol is higher when we treat them with lower concentrations and the protective effect is decreasing um, when we have higher concentrations. There is no, uh, no clear single explanations. There's a, a number of possibilities, but it's not really established so far um, what the reason of this invert dose response relationship is. Um, we see the same thing um, when we look at this in vivo. And this is also very often the question in, in genotoxicity research, how well is in vivo and in vitro, so the cell culture work and the animal experiments correlated. And we see uh, that these findings, at least here, are very much correlated. Oh, sorry. Um, what we also do is, apart from these in vitro studies, uh, culture studies, is we do biomonitoring. So we analyze samples from human beings, either from patients from the clinic or also volunteers um, 
for volunteer studies. Um, the micronuclei can be analyzed in lymphocyte. As I mentioned already, we very frequently used um, buccal mucosa cells because they're very easy to sample. And uh, we can also do that in the field, outside, anywhere. Uh, we don't need any uh, medical assistance. And what we did here is we, in this study that I want to show you is, or studies, we, sh we looked at radiation. So these are physical agents. And we looked both at uh, non-ionizing radiation and ionizing radiation. Here on top, you see um, various volunteers uh, stratified into their use of mobile phones. So this is about non-ionizing radiation. And you see that we do not see anything here. So even with fairly high, um, at that time, at least um, mobile phone use, there was no uh, increase in DNA damage. Whereas here, we have used ionizing radiation. These are cancer patients receiving um, ionizing radiation therapy, uh, either with or without chemotherapy. And uh, we do see a very clear increase here. That was established long ago, decades already. But what was interesting to us here was the kinetics, because we see that the micronucleus formation is actually already uh, increasing uh, uh, after two weeks, which was, which was not expected before. So, so this is another field of our studies using biomonitoring approaches where we look at patients or volunteers, um, but in human beings, not, not in the cell culture system. Uh, what we also do with our in vitro studies, we look at different uh, uh, cell types and compare them, especially in terms of differentiation. We looked at uh, hematopoietic stem cells. These are cells that are um, not differentiated at all. So these are the very first blood forming cells and we compared them. Uh, so, you, so you see that here and we compared them to TK6 cells. This is a, a differentiated cell line, cell line that, that is immortalized also from the blood forming system. And uh, we compared various endpoints. I'm not going to go into detail here, but just to show you that when you look at the micronucleus formation, which is here, the graph on, on the very top, you see identical concentrations for uh, hematopoietic stem cells and TK6 cells. And you see that those responses are quite different. And we, we do see increase in DNA damage at, at fairly low concentrations for the differentiated cells already, whereas in the hematopoietic stem cells, we do not see um, any increase here, which also was surprising to us. We actually expected the opposite, that the, that the stem cells would be more susceptible, which they did not show. Um, at that time, we were actually the first to introduce hematopoietic stem cells to chromosomal DNA damage, specifically using the micronucleus test. Um, now, a number of other groups have also done that, but at that time, we were the first, and maybe um, that might also um, lead to hematopoietic stem cells being a more established test system, because now at the moment there's either lymphocytes or differentiated immortalized um, cell lines, which of course is actually not for risk assessment, not what you actually aim at or want to see. Now, I would like to briefly show you what we are currently working on. We're looking at the fate of micronuclei. So the question is, once this micronucleus has formed, what happens afterwards? This is a question that has not been addressed in the last couple of years, but it's highly important for judging the relevance of micronucleus formation. And this also is in the context with causality, causal relationship between micronucleus formation and cancer formation. Uh, in theory, there is four different fates possible. The micronucleus might be uh, moving towards the periphery and then be extruded, expelled out of the cell. The opposite might be possible. So the micronucleus might move towards the main nucleus and be reincorporated, uh, specifically during the next cell division. The micronucleus might be degraded and specifically degraded, and it might just that nothing happens. Um, so, so it might just persist. And I would briefly like to show you how we do that. We use live imaging. What you see here is uh, HeLa cells. So this is an immortalized cell line. And you see already these cells divide. You can here see a micronucleus for the time being. Now we don't see too many micronuclei, but this will change later on. Um, these cells are um, modified, they are tagged with GFP, green fluorescent protein, to the histone so that we can see actually the nucleus and the micronucleus. 
um, and we follow them for 96 hours so that we have several cell division. We now start to see here the micronuclear. Here you see a nuclear plasmic bridge. Um, now it's gone, but that is also very interesting. That's a different phenomena that we also look at. And our analysis basically is at, in the first step fairly descriptive. So we, are, we just look at these micronuclei and we see what happens to them. Are they moving away from the main nucleus? Are they uh, being reincorporated either in interface or in, in, in the next mitosis? But I can say already that we do not see that in interface um, or whether it's being degraded so that that is, um, that is just lost. Um, we, of course, would like to do that also for a longer time, but more than 96 hours is practically not feasible or not easily feasible because we you see that we lose focus for many cells here and, and that's difficult for if we do it for, for longer than four to five days. Okay, just briefly uh, showing you the result for etoposide, one of the substances that we use. Um, you see, if you look first on uh, this part here on the uh, top left, you see that approximately 80% uh, persist. So this is the, here, nothing happens. The, uh, the micronucleus just stays there, but around 20% uh, of the micronuclei are being reincorporated. So they do get into the main nucleus again and are not sure, uh, not do not further exist as micronucleus. And then we have very small percentage uh, of degradation and extrusion. So almost never, almost never uh, micronuclei are degraded or expelled, which was a big surprise to us because there's many literature reports showing that this actually happens. We have to clarify these discrepancies. Um, we do not see any, to make a long story short, uh, we do not see any substance related effects. So after treatment, it's more or less the same. There is some variability, but that is biological variability. Uh, we do not see any concentration um, related effect. And we also, this is the, the latest results, uh, not published yet, but we, we, we looked at various other substances. Um, the, uh, and then basically without looking at all the different numbers, you see that it's more or less, uh, um, more or less the same. So um, this seems to be a, a general distribution of these different fates of um, micronuclei. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to skip this. This is just to show what we plan to do at the moment. We try to use photoconvertible dyes where we can label specific chromosomes and also follow them during mitosis. But I'm not going to go into detail. And I also would like to very briefly mention that a part or in addition to the cell culture models that we use, we also establish at the moment the zebrafish model, um, which some of you might know. Zebrafish has the um, beneficial effect that we have the whole organism that we can look at. We have a trans, when we look at the larvae, uh, we can look at development effects and we, we have a transparent organism. So evaluation is easy. And for us, the, 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 the charming benefit is that until day five, post-fertilization, we formally or officially have in vitro systems. So we do, don't need uh, all the animal testing regulations that is required for animal testing, but still we have the whole organisms. Now, in the last couple of minutes, I just would like to very shortly say something about regulatory toxicology. Everything before was the experimental part, but um, I have had in the past also regulatory responsibilities, and I would like to, to uh, take some of this part also to, to combine that with the experimental work that we do. Um, toxicology risk analysis is one of the major steps in regulatory uh, toxicology. It's comprised of three different steps, risk assessment, risk management, and risk communication. Risk management is the scientific part. So here we bring together all the evidence from uh, toxicology science, but also from other sciences. Risk management is about the decisions to take and which measure, measures to be taken. And risk communication, as the name says, then communicates what has been assessed and what has been done. There is four different steps in toxicology risk assessment. Uh, first, we need to identify which hazards we talk about. Then we talk about hazard characterization. This is the experimental toxicology part that I presented in the first part. 
um, we then have to assess the exposure. That is very important. It is very often forgotten. Um, you all know the current discussion about glyphosate, where basically people talk about the hazard properties of uh, glyphosate, but they completely forget about exposure. And then still a risk is being determined, which actually not is, is not a valid approach. Um, but we mainly are focused on hazard characterization. And uh, in my last two slides for the regulatory toxicology, I would just like to mention that the traditional approach for setting safe limits in regulatory regulatory toxicology is that we do have a dose response curve as you see here. And then usually there's one characteristic point from this dose response curve, be it either a no IL where no adverse effect is being observed or a so-called low IL where, the, where an adverse effect is observed, but it's the lowest level. And then one of these points is chosen as a point of departure and then a derivation of a, of a health-based guidance value, a safe limit is being proposed. And this is something that uh, there is a current development in regulatory toxicology of moving away from uh, this system and rather use a more modernized approach called benchmark modeling. Um, and uh, this is the principle, the, the very basic principle is shown here in benchmark modeling, you have a high variety of data and uh, you do not depict one of these or choose one of these data points to start your derivation, but you do, you use mathematical modeling. Um, this is the black line here showing the dose response. And then you use this mathematical model, this function, and by setting a benchmark response, you can then derive a benchmark dose and you also cover the uncertainties with it um, by uh, establishing the confidence interval and then you, you derive a so-called benchmark dose lower level um, here which again is then your point of departure but the advantage is with this system that you really use all the data that you have and you do not just choose one single um, data point and this well, why do I why am I telling you that this is something that is currently not being used in genetic toxicology. Um, this approach has been established in epidemiology. It's now being used for animal tests also, but it's not being established in in vitro genotoxicity testing. And uh, my personal opinion, and there's many others also of the same opinion is that actually this should be the way forward for genotoxicity testing as well. And so, so this is something that we will also work on in the future. We haven't done anything so far, but since I have the experiment, experience in regulatory toxicology, this is certainly something that we will deal with. Okay, as a very small outlook, uh, here's kind of the roadmap that I see for us at the Department of Food Safety. Um, certainly not everything is is, uh, is relevant for Phenorop, but I think some aspects might be. I'm not going to go into all details, but I think mainly the applied research, so either looking at specific substances, this is something that we can always do also looking at mixture toxicity. This is a hot topic in, in toxicology at the moment that has not been addressed in the past. And this, of course, can either be done for, for defined compounds. So for example, if there is a number of pesticides or contaminants that, that occur together, these can be assessed in vitro. But this can also mean human biomonitoring study, be it field workers, be it consumers that eat certain, uh, certain products or that are exposed to a mixture of certain pesticides, contaminants, that can be also assessed, even if we don't know or do not have a definition of the, of the chemical mixture, we can assess these effects by, by human biomonitoring studies. And regulatory toxicology, specifically single case assessment, might also be interesting for Phenorop. Uh, with that, I would like to thank and acknowledge our uh, cooperation partners nationally and internationally, and also the funding agencies. I would like to specific for the data that I've shown you, specifically like to mention Katharina Gläser, Grazia Montag, and uh, most of the part is from Hauke Reimann. All of the three are, were PhD students in the lab, and um, most mostly that, that was funded by DFG. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>